Well, hi everybody, welcome back for episode two of what kind of computation is human cognition? <clears throat> a brief history of thought. Uh, let me begin by reminding you that I've been asked to give a super compressed, but still hopefully coherent synopsis of my graduate course at Johns Hopkins, uh, Foundations of Cognitive Science. Uh, if you'd kindly enter your questions during the talk into the Teams chat, uh, I would appreciate it. Our MSR summer intern, Tom McCoy, who taught this course with me in the spring of this year, has kindly agreed to curate the chat channel. You'll recall that we started the lectures by noting the historical swinging uh, between building models of intelligence on symbolic versus neural computation and claiming that this instability will only be resolved by adopting neurosymbolic computation. Today's episode will in fact lead up to an argument for neurosymbolic computation of a particular type. <clears throat> and let me remind you also of Dennett's geographical metaphor in which a pretty cohesive set of theories of cognition clustering around the East Pole have grown out of a rationalist tradition based in symbolic computation in addition to many authors buried too deep in history to make it onto this chart, we discussed these authors last time, and we'll discuss another 10 of the remaining authors today, devoting more attention to Western views than last time. You will also recognize from last time this list of major theoretical issues in cognitive science, the dimensions of the theory of cognition space on which different um, proposals differ, uh, we discussed the green ones in episode one, and it will continue the orange ones in today, episode two. Okay, so episode two is gonna start off with the same issue as episode one did, one that divides contemporary East and West, the status of formal rules. Does knowledge take the form of rules? Are concepts characterized by formal definition as in mathematics? Or are knowledge and concepts characterized by examples. A major source supporting a West Coast position favoring examples is Eleanor Roche's uh, legendary work on categorization. Turning the vertical dimension of hierarchies like this taxonomy, she showed that not all categories are equal. There is a distinguished, sorry, distinguished level um, which she called the basic level. This is the most inclusive level at which category exemplars have high similarity. In this case, it's here, chairs. Concerning the horizontal level, the dimension, uh, she highlighted typicality structure. Within a category, some members are, are more than others, unlike Boolean mathematical category membership. Um, so she showed that basic level categories and prototypical category exemplars are psychologically privileged. Recall and reasoning about them is faster and more accurate. <clears throat> Many people took the results on typicality as evidence against the possibility that human categories are defined by Boolean properties and evidence for the importance of individual exemplars as opposed to general categories in cognition. For instance, in phonology, exemplar theory defines the phoneme B as the set of speech segments in memory that have been labeled as B, as opposed to the East Pole discrete category defined by Boolean features such as plus consonantal, plus voiced, plus labial, and so on. Although I do try hard to maintain an optimal degree of pedagogical neutrality in presenting this material, I do feel compelled to point out the fallacy here. Even in Boolean categories, some members are more typical than others. Suppose the category grandmother were really defined formally as a woman who bore a child who bore a child, and that membership in this category were all or none. You're either a grandmother by that definition or you're not. It would still be true that some grandmothers are more typical than others, in that some grandmothers, more than others, share properties with other grandmothers. 
a 30 year old grandmother is less similar in age, in health, in hair color, et cetera, to other grandmothers than is your prototypical 65 year old fragile white haired granny. Nonetheless, the idea that categories in particular and knowledge in general takes the form of stored examples rather than general formal definitions and rules is very popular outside the East Pole. Rosh's work had strong influence on George Lakoff, one of the founders of self-proclaimed cognitive linguistics, a diverse collection of Western theories that have in common a strong opposition to East Pole, especially Chomsky linguistics. There are other anti-formal linguistic theories too that go by the name functional linguistics, which place the function of language as the center of linguistic theory. But here, it's connections to cognition that are emphasized. Lakoff argued that human linguistic categories like noun or the phoneme B display typicality effects, that they are therefore not definable by formal definitions and that therefore linguistic knowledge cannot be a formal system. Therefore, we can toss the formal approach at the East Pole to linguistics. On the general question, what is the appropriate level of formality for cognitive theory? Is human knowledge a formal system? Cognitive linguistics says, hell no. Lakoff opposed formal approaches to cognitive science in general, arguing that cognition must be understood through how it is situated in the body and in the rest of the world. Um, he says, <clears throat> Meaningful thought and reason concern merely the manipulation of abstract symbols and their correspondence to an objective reality, independent of any embodiment, except perhaps for limitations imposed by the organism. Or the meaningful thought and reason essentially concern the nature of the organism doing the thinking, including the nature of its body, its interactions in its environment, its social character, and so on. Of course, he strongly advocates the second view there. There are some experimental results uh, that I find pretty spooky concerning uh, embodiment. A few days ago, in her invited speech uh, at the Cognitive Science Society meeting, the eminent development activist, Janet Worker, described work of her student, Alison Bruderer, showing that six-month-old English learning babies who normally react to the difference between two Hindi consonants, dental de and retroflex de, which they've never heard, no longer do so when a teething toy is placed in their mouth that prevents their tongue tip from moving. It's the curling of the tongue tip that distinguishes these Ds. These, by the way, are kids too young to babble. But if a different uh, teething toy is used, that prevents their lips from moving rather than their tongue. This uh, sucker showed, shown here. But uh, now they lose their ability to distinguish the contrast between D and B in their native language, where it is now lip movement that makes the difference. This, is, this change is evidenced not only in their behavior, it's visible as shown in this work in their brain activity as recorded by electroencephalography EEG in these regions here, where a distinction is made for one contrast and not for the other. Another argument concerning the formality of cognition is the famous Chinese room thought experiment. <clears throat> this is a thought experiment uh, that takes issue with the strong AI position that following the right kind of program, like one that passes the Turing test, is sufficient for a system to have human-like understanding and intelligence. I've omitted the name of the author, John Searle, because sadly his fame came in part at the expense of his students, some of whom were driven out of the field by sexual harassment, for which UC Berkeley stripped him of his status as emeritus professor in 2019. The thought experiment consists of a closed room containing a person and two slots. Into the input slot goes a story written in Chinese, along with a question about the story also in Chinese. From the room's output slot 
pops the answer to the question also in Chinese. The person inside, Joanna, knows only English, and she follows the instructions in a book, a manual in English, telling her what strokes to write when she sees certain strokes in the input. The book says nothing about the meaning of Chinese characters. The intuition that this thought experiment is designed to deliver is that there is nothing here that understands Chinese. Joanna doesn't. Obviously, the instruction manual, a mere book, can't understand anything. The conclusion then follows. Manipulation of meaningless symbols following even a program that passes the Turing test can't be sufficient to generate understanding or intelligence. After all, executing a program that simulates a firestorm doesn't burn the building down. Why should executing a program that simulates thought generate understanding or intelligence? Believers in strong AI must think that intelligence, unlike fire, lives in another world, a mental world disconnected from the physical world. They must be dualists in the sense of Descartes. But we, of course, are not dualists. We are physicalists who believe that cognition is a property of the physical brain. So, this paper argues, it must matter that it's a physical brain that is performing symbol manipulation in our case. That's what creates intelligence. So it's about time we bring the brain into the story. We turn finally to the remaining answer to our initial question, what is cognitive science the science of? Historically, the East Pole position in opposition to the Chinese room argument is that cognition is all about the program running in the mind or the virtual machine that runs the program. It doesn't matter what physical device implements this virtual machine. The less clear, however, is that cognitive science should pay careful attention to brain dynamics. In his landmark book, Donald Hebb laid the foundation for modern cognitive neuroscience. He attempted to link neural properties to abstract mental properties and behavior via his notion of cell assemblies. These are circuits of interconnected neurons that mutually excite each other and allow neural activation to reverberate for extended periods of time, enabling memory and sequential thought processes to link an input stimulus to a later output response. These cell assemblies come into existence through what we now call Hebbian learning. The well-worn neuroscience cliche is cells that fire together, wire together. Hebb didn't take credit for this, actually. Um, he says the general idea is an old one, that any two cells or system of cells that are repeatedly active at the same time will tend to become associated so that activity in one facilitates activity in the other. Hebbian learning is the foundation on which all subsequent neural net algorithms, learning algorithms rest. Above the level of cell assemblies is the structure of brain areas, patches that most believe are at least somewhat specialized in the type of information they process. Low level visual properties, object level visual properties, speech, etc. At the level <clears throat> of general domains of information, then, neural representation is generally believed to be localized. This is what supports the field of cognitive neuropsychology pioneered by Alfonso Caramazza and others. This field studies the cognitive impairments induced by brain damage, most often strokes. Strokes typically kill neurons in a local portion of the brain, and this often corresponds well enough to a functionally defined component of cognition. Here is a picture of a functional architecture for reading single words aloud from Karamatsu's paper. Some stroke patients lose this functional component and cannot pr pronounce non-word sequences of letters. If they can't look up the, the pronunciation in their uh, lexicon, they can't pronounce the word. Whereas patients who lose that box can sound out letter sequences using letter to sound rules, but can access the meaning of words from their written form although possibly they can through their spoken form. It's patterns of cognitive deficits of this sort across individual patients that constitutes cognitive neuroscience data for inferring the functional organization that yields unimpaired cognition in intact brains. 
Though functional components or information types seem to be localized to brain areas, within an area, information is often encoded by overlapping distributed patterns of activity rather than the activation of single neurons. On the largely outdated grandmother cell view, recognizing a face as Kim's, say the upper face with a red dot, recognizing a face as Kim's involves activating the Kim neuron as opposed to the blue sandy neuron. Um, DiCarlo and Cox in this paper argue against this view and argue that all the representations of Kim face in different poses fill out the red manifold of states here in the brain area called IT, each point on the manifold being a vector of activation distributed throughout the area. They view the job of the processing of the neural pathway for object recognition as taking the crumpled manifolds of activity patterns in low-level visual areas that encode low-level visual features and mapping them to manifolds like these in the middle that can be separated by hyperplanes. How does bringing the neural level into cognitive science affect the computational analysis of cognition? What are its implications for this fundamental computational issue? Should a cognitive theory be a computational theory, viewing the mind as a machine that takes data in, processes it according to an algorithm, and outputs behavior? In his brilliant 1979 book, Gödel Escherbach, and more concisely in this paper, Doug Hofstadter lays out an interesting Midwest position that cognition is computational at the hardware level, but not at the abstract software level. Symbols are instantiated as mutually activating neural assemblies, like Hebb's cell assemblies. These are active symbols that drive the computational dynamics themselves. They're not passive symbols, as in standard symbolic computation, where symbols just sit around until some external processor moves them. The dynamics of symbols does not follow an algorithm. The neurons that make up the symbols do. This makes the abstract symbolic level much more fluid than in standard discrete symbolic computation. A year after Hofstadter's paper, the PDP books broke on the scene. Note the subtitle, <clears throat> Explorations in the Microstructure of Cognition. Consistent with Hofstadter's view, the PDP approach strove to take computational cognitive modeling down closer to the neural level. As mentioned at the beginning of episode one of this series, children's overregularization of the regular rule for forming the past tense of English verbs, producing cummed for the past tense of came after previously having correctly used come, was a poster child phenomenon supporting the view that learning language is learning rules. In this chapter, Rommel Hart and McClelland say, there is no denying that rules still provide a fairly close characterization of the performance of our subjects, and we have no doubt that rules are even more useful in characterizations of sentence production, comprehension, and grammaticality judgments. We would only suggest that parallel distributed processing models may provide a mechanism sufficient to capture lawful behavior without requiring the postulation of explicit but inaccessible rules. As with Hofstadter, they're claiming that micro-level elements, neurons, obey algorithms, and that approximate abstract macro-level rules emerge from the global system behavior, but the system cannot be described precisely as algorithmically following rules. They are presenting an alternative to postulation of explicit but inaccessible rules of language. Now, who are they arguing against? <clears throat> Production rule learning theories of the CMU school, like John Anderson's, do treat rules as symbolic data structures that are examined and revised during learning algorithms, a clear case of explicit rules in my view. But linguists don't commit to their rules being explicit. They characterize linguistic competence as describable with rules, as rule governed, while remaining uncommitted on how that is achieved. 
they say nothing about whether there are algorithms uh, to manipulate these rules. They say nothing at all about algorithms, period, so they can remain agnostic as to whether linguistic rules are operated on explicitly. This is where it's convenient to work exclusively at Mars' most abstract computational level, abstracting away above the level of algorithms, as theoretical linguistics historically has done. Now, on the flip side, neural models commit to a low-level description of processing, but do not generally make explicit claims on more abstract levels. In 1991, McCloskey pointed out that connectionist models do not come with a theory that they instantiate, even a weak sense of theory, such as a functional architecture like the one we saw from Karamatsa earlier. Which details are, of the model are relevant to the hypotheses being tested, and which are just arbitrary implementation choices? This is especially difficult when the model structure arises from learning. All of this makes it difficult to assign credit and blame for what parts of the model are responsible for its successes and what for its failures, and makes it very difficult to compare to previous theories which aspect of those theories are falsified by this model. Two years after Rommel Hart and McClellan's paper on the past tense, Steven Pinker and Alan Prince published a review, which I think they hoped would have the same effect as Chomsky's review 30 years earlier of Skinner's book, which we talked about in episode one. The goal being to convince the East Pole that the latest rebellion on the West Coast had been completely crushed. Early in the paper, they fired off this bullet cartridge loaded with a dozen bullets. All the failures, one after the other, of Rommel Hart and McClellan's analysis. To show the inferiority of the PDP account relative to the symbolic orthodoxy that they were defending, they had to overcome McCloskey's observation of the incommensurability of PDP models and bona fide theories. They had to construct a McCloskey-style theory for the Rommel Hart McClellan model to assign credit and blame for aspects of the account that can be compared with symbolic rule theories. This was a tour de force and not quickly done. This paper was 120 pages long, more than twice as long as the 55-page paper they were critiquing. And I would say it achieved what Pinker and Prince hoped it would. The damage was so severe that 30 years later, Kirov and Cotterill found it worth the effort, which I mentioned in episode one, to resuscitate the PDP approach to morphology with a paper in Tackle in 2018. Pinker and Prince's paper was one of three long papers in a special issue of the journal Cognition, which was the official party-sanctioned mouthpiece of the East Pole. The papers in this crush connectionism issue were predictably convincing to those of the East Pole and profoundly irritating to those of the West. The lead article defended the philosophical sector of the East Pole, authored by Jerry Fodor, the epitome of East Pole philosophy, and Zen and Polition, a prominent flag bearer for East Pole cognitive science generally, especially in vision, Fodor and Polition's paper is frequently cited nowadays by deep learning researchers working on compositionality, one of four key cognitive properties they discussed. Their critique assumed the context of philosophical semantics, where the meaning of a thought is its truth conditions, so that the meaning of the thought that Kim loves Sandy is the proposition loves Kim Sandy, which is true in any world where the person referred to by Kim stands in the love relation with the person referred to by Sandy. In this expression, mu is the meaning function. Fodor and Polition argued that an adequate theory of cognition must explain why cognition necessarily displays four key properties. Systematicity, the set of meanings of all possible thoughts of an agent, is the set of all well-formed propositions built from the sets of predicates and individuals known to the agent. Thus, if an agent can think the thought with meaning loves Kim Sandy, they must know the predicate love and the individuals Kim and Sandy, 
So the agent can also think the thought loves Sandy Kim. Second property of cognition that a theory must explain according to uh, Fodor and Polition is productivity. The set of an agent's possible thoughts and, health, and hence of possible meanings is infinite. Third property is compositionality. Meanings compose so that the meaning of SVO is the meaning of V applied to the meaning of S and the meaning of O, as we saw directly with Kim Love Sandy in the orange box above. Finally, the last property was inferential coherence. The set of possible inferences from a set of beliefs B that a cognitive agent possesses is the closure of a set of the agent's known rules of inference operating on B. Here, I've given a rational reconstruction of Fodor and Polition's argument, which is stated much less precisely. Fodor and Polition claim that the language of thought theory meets this quadruple requirement, where the language of thought due to Fodor asserts that an agent's set of thoughts is a formal language generated by a grammar over thought constituents like Love and Kim and Sandy. Their position, of course, is that the kind of structure um, in representations is discrete. <clears throat> Their grand conclusion was that connectionism must implement a language of thought or it can't meet their adequacy condition. I had a prolonged debate in the literature with Fodor and his collaborators spanning over a half dozen publications. In a 1994 paper, I pointed out that the language of thought only entails therefore target properties when it is supplemented with several strong assumptions. The language of thought's grammar must be assumed to be recursive or you don't derive productivity. The language of thought semantics must be presumed to be composition or you don't get that. Inference within the language of thought must be unconstrained rule application. The point is that these assumptions simply stipulate as bald assumptions <clears throat> the truth of their four conditions. Their symbolic theory doesn't explain them. It just describes them. It doesn't derive them from any principles other than themselves. I also explicitly presented a connectionist theory that truly does solve, sorry, that truly does solve uh, the uh, explanation of systematicity and productivity. Um, as for compositionality and inferential coherence, it would be necessary to supplement the connectionist theory I gave with assumptions uh, that are directly parallel to the ones that they have to make for the language of thought. So <clears throat> from that, um, I want to pass to a much more recent debate, um, an East-West debate in trends in cognitive science in 2010. In this issue, a main, in this debate, a main issue was whether cognitive theory is bottom up uh, or top down. Tom Griffiths, Nick Chater, Charles Kemp, Amy Perfors, and Josh Tenenbaum argued that probabilistic models over symbolic hy hypothesis spaces enable exploration of a variety of representational structures, not just the vector spaces of neural nets. With Morris' top-down approach, computational modeling does not depend on correctly characterizing implementation level structure, for example, the structure of a neural net, before knowing what higher level capabilities it enables. I'll add another important argument from a later paper by Sam Gershman, Eric Horvitz, and Tannenbaum, namely that these models allow decision-making to optimize utility, including computational costs and computational constraints. This work, of course, defends the proposition that cognitive representations have discrete structure. Uh, in large part. On the other side, Jay McClelland, Matt Botvinnik, Dave Noel, Dave Plout, Tim Rogers, Mark Seidenberg, and Linda Smith advocate a bottom-up approach 
starting with a continuous dynamical computational system, one type being neural networks, um, which allows learning rather than the modeler to determine the structure appearing at higher levels and does not depend on correctly characterizing computational level structure in advance. Rather, it commits to fundamental computational mechanisms. They say, from our perspective, the hypotheses, hypothesis space and data structures of the structured probabilistic approach, defended by Griffiths et al., are not the building blocks of an explanatory theory. Rather, they are sometimes helpful, but often misleading, approximate characterizations of the emergent consequences of the real underlying processes. Likewise, the entities over which these hypotheses are predicated, such as concepts, words, morphemes, syllables, and phonemes, are themselves best understood as sometimes useful but sometimes misleading approximations. Neural networks uh, representations are continuous vectors having no explicit structure. So what do McClelland et al. mean by the structure emerging at higher levels in their neural models. It's, this structure is not explicit, uh, but it can be extracted by the modeler by analyzing properties of the network's continuous vector representations. <clears throat> Here are some examples. Uh, first, from the paper itself, uh, this model was discussed. Um, in this model, activation flows from left to right. It completes rational, sorry, relational fact triples, such as in this picture, canary, can, question mark, which completes to four properties, grow, move, and so on. The representation layer learns a distributed representation of the entities with structure in this space organizing gradually, as shown over these successive snapshots. Uh, during training. Eventually, it learns a kind of phylogenetic hierarchy revealed through hierarchical cluster analysis of the vectors in the representation uh, layer. Here are these same vectors plotted in 2D via principal components analysis. The structure of the hidden space here is rearranged depending on which relation is being queried. The rearrangement reflects the similarity of the entities as arguments of the particular relation. In the top box here, the relation is, and in the bottom box, reconfiguration for the relation can. So this is pretty much what they give as an example of structure emerging at higher levels um, in this uh, paper in 2010. Uh, but I'll mention uh, some examples from another um, era. Uh, this is from Jeff Ellman's uh, uh, epic making paper, Finding Structure in Time, uh, where he introduced what we now call the recurrent neural network with input symbols coming in one at a time. The network simply predicting the next symbol. The structure here is in the mean squared error of the prediction over time. That's what's plotted here. Segmenting the string at the peaks of this error does a pretty good job of parsing out the words. You can see that at each peak, a new word begins, mostly. Many years ago, a boy and girl lived by, and so on. You can see that it groups a uh, and boy together as many uh, such model learning models and end up doing, as a matter of fact. Uh, but in any event, the point is that the, the model has extracted structure in the stream of letters, which uh, were generated by a uh, sentence grammar. Um, a year later, Elman presented a similar model, now taking as input words and sentences generated by a simple grammar with embedding. These are the first two principal components of the hidden state starting at the lower right while processing the sentence, boy chases boy, who chases boy, who chases boy. The encodings of who cluster together, but each encodes the depth of embedding of the clause it introduces. 
This enabled the model to learn subject verb agreement across intervening embedded clauses. So it learned to correctly match boy with chases and boys with chase. <clears throat> Another example of structure uh, of this sort, I take it, that uh, McClellan et al. were referring to. I'd like to close with an argument of my own um, <clears throat> that coordinating bottom-up and top-down theory development allows progress on one of the most abstract problems of cognitive science, the theory of universal grammar. That is to say, giving an account of the properties that the grammars of all human languages share and precisely characterizing the limited ways in which they may differ from one another. At the same time, this coordination of bottom-up and top-down theory development allows progress on neural network architecture. This argument was made in a two-volume book published in 2006. Uh, later work here um, took on uh, unification of discrete and continuous structure in cognitive representations. Okay, so this, which is my final slide before the summary, this is an elaboration of the summary slide of a talk you can watch on YouTube for more information. It was presented at the inaugural meeting of the Society for Computation in Linguistics. The main claim of the talk is that strong synergies exist between the grammar of symbol structures and neural network computation, that is, integrating the East Pole and West Coast perspectives could strengthen them both. This is the neurosymbolic approach to modeling intelligence that I advocate. The key is the idea of integrating these perspectives vertically, of viewing symbolic and connectionist models as characterizing one and the same computational system at two different levels of description. A, a micro level, where the microstructure looks like a neural network, and viewing the same thing at a higher level, the macro level, we see symbol structures. This is modeled after the same kind of cross-relational structure, level structure that you see in, say, computer science, where virtual machines that uh, are folder manipulators or graphics processors or NLP programs, these macrostructural uh, machines um, are emergent from microstructures which contain a bit processing. And in physics, we also see that the macrostructure properties of macroscopic materials, like the gas in this tank, um, the properties that this uh, that this material has at this level of description include things like temperature and pressure, but the same exact system when described at the microstructural level consists of a set of molecules. They don't have temperature, they don't have pressure. They have velocity, momentum, uh, and uh, the relation between the two is mathematically prescribed by uh, statistical mechanics. Okay, so we're emulating this relationship here, but now we're linking a discrete upper level structure, symbolic structure, with a continuous lower level structure. Upper level, we, what we have uh, embedded in the continuous vector space is approximately discrete structure. <clears throat> structure in neurons approach to neurosymbolic computation, which I favor, as opposed to neurons in structure, um, which takes um, a uh, symbolic model and replaces some of the components with neural networks. Uh, the second approach develops hybrid architectures, as currently advocated by Gary Marcus. Now, I am also a fan of this type of neurosymbolic computation is possible to take advantage of the power of symbolic structure right away using these hybrids in a way that's only gradually merging in the structure and neurons approach. So it's a more long-term paradigm. Uh, the neurons and structure approach 
has been uh, well developed at MSR by Alex Polozov and co collaborators, achieving remarkable results in automatic program synthesis. Back to the vertically integrated system, at the lower level, the micro level, we have neurons that follow precise algorithms, but cannot be meaningfully interpreted. The macro level symbols can be meaningfully interpreted, but they do not follow precisely specifiable algorithms. This instantiates Hofstadter's general picture. So with that background out of the way, let me summarize the four theoretical synergies developed in this work. First, from the top down. Um, an important part of symbolic structure is compositional structure. And it's possible to take comp compositional structure, which is natively given at the higher level, and push it down to realize compositional structures and activation patterns, um, which is exactly the kind of pattern we were looking at here in this structure on the right under Frodo lives. It's possible to realize these compositional structures in activation patterns themselves have a kind of compositional structure. These are special kind of vectors called tensor product representations. I don't have time to go into the details there. That's another talk of its own. Suffice it to say that this top-down route enriches the theory of neural computation with the notion of these embedded compositional structures in the form of TPRs. Grammar side of the higher level description, the grammars are all about well-formedness. And it's possible to take the notion of well-formedness down to the neural level too. <clears throat> you can actually realize grammatical well-formedness as a function called harmony, which evaluates the degree of satisfaction of micro-constraints that are embedded in the network weights. The harmony of a network state is a measure of its well-formedness. Processing in the neural network seeks out states of high harmony, avoids states of low harmony, um, <clears throat> and this can all be viewed as a kind of constraint satisfaction process where individual weights constitute constraints on the coactivation of the units that they connect. Okay, so again, we have uh, enriching the lower level, a concept of well-formedness, uh, which can do a lot of the work that grammars do in the higher level theory uh, as subsequent work. <clears throat> Now, from the bottom-up direction, these networks uh, that I was just referring to optimize harmony. Their activation spreading algorithms are optimization algorithms that seek out states of high harmony. Um, this conception of what you do with the notion of well-formedness can be pulled up to the higher level to give new kinds of grammars, because this is not how grammatical well-formedness was conceived of before. Now it's conceived of as something that you need to optimize. When harmony is brought up to the grammatical level, it is uh, used to define a new kind of grammar called harmonic grammar, where the grammatical uh, discrete structures are those that have maximal harmony, where harmony is a, a numerical measure of well-formedness now. Grammaticality now becomes equated with optimality. Uh, there are de uh, deterministic and probabilistic versions of harmonic grammar. So, what harmonic grammars um, negotiate is a set of grammatical constraints that say, for example, sentences should have subjects or uh, syllables should start with a consonant. These are constraints that populate the grammar, but they conflict with each other. And the only way to determine what is optimal is to assign different strengths to the constraints so that the stronger constraints have priority over the weaker constraints. And in harmonic grammar, the notion of strength is 
formalized in numerical weights. So we actually compute a numerical penalty score for violating some set of constraints, and that's what we try to uh, optimize in order to find the grammatical structures. However, um, very shortly after uh, harmonic grammar was created in 1990, Alan Prince and I um, moved the uh, notion of grammatical strength out of the realm of numbers into a more uh, symbolic realm. Uh, so what resulted was optimality theory in which a grammar, as before, consists of a bunch of constraints that often conflict with each other, uh, and grammatical uh, structures are the ones that best satisfy these constraints given their relative strengths. But now the relative strength is encoded in a hierarchy such that higher constraints have absolute priority over lower constraints. Uh, it can be, but it need not be. Um, <clears throat> constraint uh, ranking, the hierarchy, um, is specific to a language, but the constraints are not. They're universal. So this is where the contribution to universal grammar arises. It provides a way of specifying the content of universal grammar as a set of constraints that operate to determine well-formedness in all natural languages. And the only way that languages can differ is in how they priority rank those universal constraints. Um, it, it's kind of symbolic, actually. I don't have it on the slide here, but in terms of trying to reconcile what were previously viewed as conflicting neural network approaches versus symbolic approaches, um, it happens that Prince and I met uh, at a debate where I was to defend connectionism and he was to defend rule-based um, uh, linguistics, he being the prince of Pinker and Prince. Um, uh, but we um, saw value in each other's differed, differing uh, positions and worked together, and optimality theory was the result of that. The last um, connection between the levels here, again, a bottom-up connection, um, is that neural network computation has continuously varying vector representations. This kind of continuity is often called gradients in, in uh, cognitive science. The representations uh, are graded uh, rather than discrete. And this also can be pulled up to the higher level uh, to introduce the notion of gradient symbol structures. Uh, so um, these gradient symbol structures can be evaluated by harmonic grammar, so you can still define what is a grammatical structure, even though the structure consists of partially active uh, symbols arranged in different positions in the structure. Okay, I believe that the contributions to both macro theory and micro theory here provide strong evidence for the value of this integrated bottom-up, top-down research strategy, the value of integrating the best of symbolic and neural network uh, approaches to the study of intelligence. As for the value of one of the contributions, optimality theory, uh, you don't need to take my word for it, uh, thanks to a quote that I just got from Tom McCoy a few days ago. Thanks, Tom. Um, a paper uh, called the On the Rapid Expansion of Optimality Theory at the End of the 20th Century. This is not the same, this is not the same by the way. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, and so, as I said, this is uh, based on the summary slide of this talk. You can see on YouTube, uh, the talk goes uh, considerably further. The fifth point, which is application of these ideas in NLP. This is work done at Microsoft. Uh, but that is a whole other talk, which unfortunately we don't have time for today. Uh, but you'll pay attention to that uh, in this video, and you can see many of the relevant papers on archive uh, authored by me and collaborators here at Microsoft. Let me summarize. Uh, we've 
seen from many different authors a number of claims, arguments, for example, specific examples, and not just general rules, figure centrally in human knowledge. Knowledge is situated and embodied. Even speech perception in infants is strongly connected to the motoric aspects of speech. Matter what machine and intelligent program is running in. Micro-level algorithm following neurons can self-organize to form macro-level symbol systems with structure and dynamics that are flexible and non-discrete and can only be approximated by discrete symbolic algorithms. Cognition requires compositionally structured, but not necessarily discrete, representations. And finally, I was arguing that development of cognitive theory needs to integrate bottom-up and top-down methods, and that doing so can lead to unified neurosymbolic styles of computation that strengthen both micro and macro level theories. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to pass to questions. All right. Uh, Tom, would you like to go ahead and uh, uh, take charge of the moderator? Because the chat is on for some people, if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand and then uh, Tom will talk to the Q&A session. Okay, so uh, Yash was first. Um, hey, Paul. Uh, I'm Yasha. Uh, I just had a question. Uh, I've been looking into the open cog system recently, and it has a similar idea of, you know, combining symbolic system and the new and the neural net system into into from to a AGI, like to create AGI. So what are your thoughts on that system? If you're if you're like, um, if you have worked with the system? Um, well, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the system. Um, and I look forward to learning about it from you and others. Um, but um, let me just um, say that uh, the uh, contrast I was trying to make between um, neural uh, neurons and symbols versus symbols and neurons uh, is surely relevant here uh, because um, the uh, most accessible kind of an integrated systems are these hybrid systems for which it would make sense to develop an API that combined primitives from symbolic computation and neural network computation, which then could be woven together, uh, essentially, as I was saying, by uh, conceptually taking, building a symbolic uh, and replacing certain parts of it, certain functions, for example, with neural networks. But I'm afraid I don't know enough to say more than that. Does that um, uh, have any relevance? Yeah, uh, that does make sense. So, are, are, is your idea uh, relating, you know, like for the hybrid approach approach to, to is it towards the AGI of like the dream that we all have in AI? So, is that is that what the you know the hybrid system is uh, supposed to or like, is able to is capable of like achieving? Is that something you think uh, the hybrid system is capable of achieving? Are capable of achieving what? AGI? AGI. Yeah. Um, well, despite the tradition of making naively over optimistic uh, predictions about the success of one's approach to AI, um, I think I will refrain from that. I think this uh, uh, structure in neurons approach that I was outlining in the last slide um, offers, uh, in the long term, our best chance of combining the best of uh, both worlds, of putting neural and symbolic computation together in a way that allows the strengths of neural computation to overcome the weaknesses of symbolic computation and vice versa. Gotcha. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone else had questions, feel free to raise your hand on Teams. Uh, Gonzalo? It, more than a question, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a fun series of, of thoughts. Uh, uh, you mentioned in a point you made about uh, the, the need for 
or describing all possible thoughts of being infinite. And I, and I was wondering if we can if you can elaborate a bit more. Do you mean cogent thoughts, grammar, or just grammatically correct thoughts? Uh, couldn't help thinking about you know uh, Jorge Luis Borges' Universal Library, where all possible works of literature are mm -hmm. exist, yet the library is finite. Um, so um, so I, I don't know if, if 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 there's a distinction to be made about generating uh, sentences that are infinite, you know, in, in quantity, but uh, ones that are sensible in, in quantity. Well, um, the comment about infinity of thoughts was in the context of this um, very strong East Pole view that Fodor and Politian were advocating, uh, where they are working at a level of abstraction that has um, no regard for any kind of um, uh, um, practical or sensible uh, to uh, what a mind might actually be able to do. Um, so it's an idealization. Um, I personally think it's a valuable idealization. I've learned a lot from trying to see how neural networks can try to approach that idealization. Um, but uh, it's not that work that's going to tell you the right way to um, take into consideration uh, the limitations uh, that the human um, cognitive architecture imposes on thought. Uh, there's certainly plenty of other places to look for that, but not with Floater and Politian's work. Uh, the um, infinitely many books in a finite library, um, since in the spirit of your uh, considering fun uh, things to think about along the lines of uh, issues in the talk. Uh, I can say that um, there are um, approaches <clears throat> to embedding, um, let's say, strings, uh, or let's say that's the most uh, worked out case I know, embedding s symbolic strings in vector spaces, uh, which uh, use fractal encodings. So Basically, every time a new symbol is added to the string, um, the representational uh, space available shrinks to a region inside what you had before. And the next symbol comes in, it shrinks again. Um, mm -hmm. But within the region accessible to you when each symbol comes in, uh, you do the same thing to store which symbol it is. Um, and so in a bounded uh, vector space, um, you can embed arbitrarily long strings. Um, of course, it requires infinite precision to be able to do that. Um, that is cool. Uh, maybe Thank Borges you. would have been happy with that. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. Okay, so we also had a couple um, questions left over from last time. So um, I think a couple of those might be interesting since we have a little bit of time here. So first, um, Matt had asked, it seems like there are two possible goals for the types of work you've showed. Number one, for the scientific value of understanding people and their methods for cognition, or number two, to inform attempts at building something intelligent. So are both directions interesting to cognitive scientists? And um, does the work you've presented here tend to have as a goal one of those as opposed to the other? Um, so um, at at the birth of cognitive science, AI uh, was a really central uh, component of the coalition of fields that were coming together. Uh, so I think there was fairly wide acceptance of the idea that intelligence uh, or cognition could be at a sufficiently abstract computational level um, that what you're talking about could it just as easily be implemented in uh, a computing system or, or in a brain, um, or maybe not just as easily, just as difficultly. Um, the, um, <clears throat> uh, so at that time, um, many of the founders of AI were uh, in this cognitive science realm, um, and I don't think there was a lot of um, attention, uh, I could, very well could be wrong, to making an effort to distinguish uh, the study of cognition in machines and in people. Um, uh, but um, as 
uh, the field of computer science in general uh, within academia turned from more theoretical to more applied uh, emphasis. Um, I think AI came along with it. Um, and uh, now um, it's not uh, so common to find um, prominent researchers in AI who think that what they're working on is in large part trying to understand human cognition as well as build smart machines. Uh, however, there are some people obviously who think that. Um, and um, the kind of work that I am, uh, I talked about uh, through most of these, most, most of the time in these lectures um, was by people who I would uh, say uh, felt that contributing to the understanding of human cognition was kind of a non-negotiable aspect of doing cognitive science, uh, although the contribution could be pretty indirect and abstract, as I was saying the original founders of the field conceived it to be. Um, so uh, I do think that um, uh, just as, you know, building implemented systems to demonstrate that your ideas actually work in some scaled up environment is important to the computer science culture. It's also important to the more empirical side of cognitive science that when you build models, you should look at human data and you should see whether your model can be informed by human data, by ways in which it fails to predict it and ways you can improve the model or ways in which your model makes new predictions that can drive new experimentation. So for many people in cognitive science, it's probably uh, uh, almost a um, non-negotiable item that uh, to do cognitive science, uh, you must be somehow speaking uh, in a direct way to uh, empirical data about uh, humans uh, do doing cognitive tasks. Um, so I don't know if I've actually addressed that question. I danced around it more than I addressed it, I suppose. But um, that was from Matt, you said? Yes. I want to say, Matt, anything about um, this question or answer? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a good answer. I was mostly curious, so I I, uh, I agree with you. I mean, most people working in AI are probably not as interested in the human connection. But when you were speaking, especially last week, about models showing, you know, you, you showed like architectures with different kinds of memory and different kinds of functioning units, and that this was sort of a model for cognition. Uh, so so um, yeah, so I guess I was just curious, for cognitive scientists, is it is the goal to be understanding how humans do cognition and build models and have it informed by humans? Or is the goal to understand cognition so we can build something intelligent? And it sounds like you're saying the first one, uh, at least the first one, uh, and then maybe uh, with as a, as a direction for the second. But OK, yeah, so you totally answered my question. Yes, thank you. Yes, but I'll also remind you of something that um, Ben Van Dorme raised uh, in the question period last time. Um, and uh, which um, Eric Horvitz followed up uh, on in um, subsequent communication uh, that um, the um, study of cognition under constraint um, has been, uh, has seen a lot of progress in the paper uh, that he was an author on that I mentioned today, for example. Uh, a lot of it is reviewed. Um, that um, cognition under the kind of constraints that short-term memory imposes on the human system that Newell and Simon were worried about um, could be very different computation that results than systems that have no, no, nothing resembling that kind of that kind of constraint operating on them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And as I said last time, also, uh, people that are working in, in human computer systems try to make that a, a a feature and not a bug to try to make good use of the differences between what and what uh, current computers do well uh, in virtue of their very different constraints to decompose tasks appropriately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, there's a question from Ida. Yes, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful series of lectures. It's been such a pleasure. Um, my question concerns the universality of the language of thought. If I understood sort of the earlier 80s ideas correctly, 
it is supposed to be sort of universal. Whereas uh, Stan DeHaan during the Cox Eye 2020, when he was sort of um, giving his award lecture, he was showing that um, a huge body of work where geometric processing in humans seems to have similar language-like properties, but uh, neither the brain areas um, uh, sort of converge with the uh, natural language areas. So there was this possibility that there might be not a un universal language of thought, but there are sort of these different separate uh, 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 pathways to it. Um, so I'm wondering what is the perspective of your harmonic model or what is the sort of how do you see it now in this kind of uh, synergy between the East and West? Oh, well, that's a fascinating question. Thank you, Aya. Um, I would uh, say that um, the approach that I uh, was, um, that I am pursuing, the uh, structure and neurons approach, um, uh, aims to try to provide uh, deep learning systems uh, with the primitive materials that they need so that they can learn to build their own symbolic computational systems. Um, and uh, it seems that um, following what Stan was saying in his in, in that uh, was uh, you could w very well imagine that the the primitive materials that you use to build your systems will not be domain universal um, and so uh, a deep learning system given the kind of primitives that are ideal for building numerical cognition uh, might end up proceeding in a rather different way than another deep learning system given the raw material to um, construct hierarchical syntax. Um, so uh, I think that there's uh, a nice opportunity to pursue that uh, domain dependent structural uh, cognition um, hypothesis. Does that make sense, Ida? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, and I think a good question to end on would be the one that um, Jason Eisner left last week. Um, so he gave it in a general form and a specific form, so you could answer either. So the general form was, what's your modern perspective on the intellectual history you've recounted? And the more specific form was, of the scholars you've discussed, um, were they usually disagreeing about actual mental behavior? Questions like whether language and reasoning behave categorically or what kind of inductive bias humans have? Or were they mainly arguing about how to accurately describe the behavior? For example, when should we use the word intelligence or when should we use a model with latent variables? Well, um, taking the more uh, specific question first, um, I do think that um, it may be only the Turing paper of those that I discussed um, that I would uh, consider um, addressing how we should talk about cognition. Um, I think the other work, if I'm not missing anything in my mental run through, um, I think the other work uh, was all about um, how the mind works and the scientific uh, description of its workings, um, as opposed to how we should talk about it in a more um, You know, in a less scientific context. Um, so uh, I think it was, these are genuine debates about um, what's uh, the right formal description of what's happening inside our heads. Um, first question, um, well, last week I didn't say much about it uh, when Jason asked this question about what my modern perspective on these, um, these classical uh, debates, shall we say, uh, uh, would be. But uh, in today's uh, presentation, I tried to, sh to show at the end uh, what I thought about that, um, which is uh, that I do think that uh, what emerges from this uh, back and forth uh, pendulum swing is that uh, the compositional structure of uh, symbolic representations um, is a fundamental part of what makes cognition possible and uh, likely what makes uh, AGI possible, in my view. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, using continuous spaces to embed these uh, compositional representations in um, is crucial for allowing the magic of deep learning to uh, operate. Um, so I do think that um, there are ways to, to pull together uh, a coherent subset of uh, views that were uh, often conceived of as uh, in opposition before, but which can actually be uh, reconciled um, with uh, an appropriate mixture of techniques uh, and uh, perspectives from both the East and the West. Um, so that's a general answer to a general question. Thanks. And it looks like Yash has a question. And actually, we do have a couple minutes. So um, Yash, if you want to ask. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, hey, well, so I had one more question regarding the hybrid approach. So uh, how much uh, efficiency or like how do you think uh, the hybrid approach can help us with the transfer learning problem that we are seeing in deep neural nets right now, where you know we train the models on a narrow subset and then we want to transfer the learning to a different domain, maybe related domain, but uh, even unrelated domain. So uh, do you think the hybrid approach can help us in that uh, solving that problem somehow? Well, I, I do see a way. Um, I do think that um, symbolic representations um, in virtue of the abstract general um, uh, semantics of the of the symbols um, and their structures um, do um, provide a more universal foundation for performing different tasks, for using the knowledge in different ways, um, as opposed to knowledge that has been uh, learned by deep learning in the context of performing some particular task and with the input from some particular uh, data set. So, um, I do think that um, the value of these uh, abstract representations um, will play uh, an important role in bringing the uh, neurosymbolic systems uh, to a level of general purpose knowledge um, uh, that uh, uh, that we're looking for. Um, so um, I think that traditional symbolic AI um, had general purpose knowledge. It's just that the knowledge it had wasn't really the right knowledge. Um, that is to say, the uh, squeezing of uh, our um, uh, human uh, common sense and uh, knowledge of language and all that, trying to squeeze it into the constraints of discrete representations and uh, computation meant that the knowledge that was being um, utilized uh, in traditional AI systems uh, really did not have the richness uh, to to cope with the complexities of the problem the way that modern distributed representations begin to do. Uh, so I do think that what was right was that the form of the knowledge made it very general. Uh, but what was wrong was that the formal character of the knowledge was very limited. Um, well, limited. And so the, the neurosymbolic approach um, holds the potential for bringing together the generality that we want uh, without the confines and restrictions of uh, discrete symbolic computation. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, thanks, Yash. OK, and so we're at time, I guess, Matt, if you wanted to yeah. close it. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That was uh, that was great. Um, and thank you again, Paul. Uh, really appreciate the lectures and, and your expertise. And anyone else who has questions, I know Paul is a very approachable person. I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, take questions offline through email. Uh, so let's thank Paul again. Thank you for your questions. And I welcome more of them. All right. Thank you, Paul. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Take care. <laughs>